Hello and welcome everyone to the side event for Skills to Pay the Bills, the juncture of education and employment. My name is Vera, I work for Forest Europe, the Liaison Unit Bonn in Germany, and here I'm responsible for green jobs and forest education. It's my pleasure to moderate this session today with all the contributing partners, namely IFSA, UFRO, EFI, ILO, the Thun Institute, and Natural Resources Canada. I would like to thank the World Forestry Congress for the opportunity to host this event. And also I would like to thank our technical assistants, Santiago and Jose. I'm looking forward to the event today, which is uh, very timely. Uh, we are living in a time with a lot of challenges and transition. I'm honored to have very high level speakers with me here today um, who will come into dialogue from four different stakeholder groups. We have the employment side, education, students, and policy perspective. But first, let's set the scene with scientific findings from the Thun Institute, a research institute in Germany. It's my pleasure to introduce Emeline Joma da Silva. She's a researcher at the Thun Institute in Germany since 2021. Her research is about the quality of employment inside the pan-European forest sector, um, Emmeline has a PhD in Renewable Resources and Bioeconomy at the University of Hamburg since 2018. She also has two master degrees, one from Wood Economics from the University of Hamburg and one from Wood Industrial Engineering Diploma from the Federal University of Paraná in Brazil. Emmeline, the floor is yours. Thank you, Vera. Hello everyone, my name is Emeline Joma and I work at the Tuna Institute in Hamburg. Today I'm going to talk a little bit more about the green uh, forest jobs and the future of the forest sector workforce. So at first I'm going to explain what are green jobs and talk a little bit about the terminologies and then we are going to see a little bit about the size and characteristics of the forest sector workforce inside the pan-european region and talk about the job quality uh, that this forest sector workforce is facing. At the end I will just summary a little bit about the trends and challenges and opportunities we are going to face in the uh, near future. So green jobs are uh, defined by the International Labour Organization as jobs that contribute to preserving or restoring environmental quality, protect ecosystems and biodiversity, and decarbonize the economy, and reduce energy, material, and water consumption. So in other words, avoid waste pollution. But the most important and a highlight of this definition is that green jobs are decent jobs. They must be decent jobs. And what are decent jobs? So more precisely, decent jobs are jobs that are productive, provide adequate incomes and social protection, respect the rights of works, and give them a say in decisions that will affect their lives. The green forest jobs are the green jobs inside the forest economies, and they are described by the Food and Agricultural Organization as jobs that complies with the principles of sustainable forest management, contributes to the green economy, and are involved in the manufacture of forest products or in the performance of forest services. And what is the forest sector? So the forest sector can be uh, possibly divided into two thematic uh, sectors. We have the first one, the traditional one, which are these economic activities you can see in the left side of the screen, named it uh, by the International Standard Industrial Classification or in courts, uh, ISIC. And we have then forestry and logging, manufacturing of wood products and paper products, manufacture of furniture and printing. We have also the what we can call contemporary forest sector or new established forest economies which also includes the traditional forest sector, but also uh, economic activities that are not exclusively from the forest sector, for example, education and research. And uh, forest uh, education is really important uh, to um, give the uh, workers 
the qualifications they need to perform a job inside the forest sector. Here we have the first issue related to forest uh, education, which is inside the pan-European region, we can see uh, from 2016 till 2019, a decrease in the number of graduated students. For the master degrees, the numbers stay more or less stable. But here, another issue we can observe is the, the little participation of women students. And this then gender gap will also be a result in the forest sector workforce. So inside the pan-European region, uh, we have at least 5 million persons engaged in a job inside this uh, forest sector, but female workers are not more than 21% of these workers. Uh, well, this is an issue and another one is regarding the aging of uh, this workforce. So we can see that the sector is getting old and there is no replacement by uh, younger uh, young people. So few, fewer young people are entering the forestry sector. And this is a reflection from the little number of uh, degrees regarding uh, forest related students. But how, why people are not interested to, to join the forest sector anymore. So how is the forest sector reputation? And as I mentioned before, we are going to say something about the job quality or quality of employment. One of these indicators is occupational safety and health at work. And if we look uh, this graphic regarding the traditional forest sector, we can see that accidents, non-fatal accidents are decreasing since 2009. Still, forestry is one of the most dangerous uh, occupations uh, in the world. Another important uh, um, indicator of um, job quality is income. And we know that gender gap is a reality in almost all economic uh, activities around the world, especially for those with higher hierarchy, which are, for example, managers or non-manual works. But if we look uh, a specific occupation related to the forest economy, which is the skilled forestry uh, workers, we can see in uh, red, in the red box, we can see that the payment in these occupations are little. And this could be a reason why the reputation uh, of the forest sector is not so good. But we don't have just bad news. Uh, here we have uh, also the opportunity to avoid labor shortage. And the forest sector should then adapt to the modern society needs, uh, investing in, uh, for example, education and improving the green skills to adapt to this uh, new uh, society. Also, the stimulation of contemporary of this new established forest sector is really important. So to see the field, we have already uh, economic activities related to forests and the woodland cemetery or adventure parkers, but we have also some psychological therapies and children education inside foresters. And these are the big challenges to create new green jobs in the forest sector. We are transiting to this green economy and the forest sector workforce will also experience new working models, for example, the part-time jobs that can be combined with education and upskilling and reskilling. And we have also the hybrid uh, variety of working and mechanization and technological development will play an important role in create green jobs to create better conditions for the forest sector workforce. So summary again, uh, we have here some issues uh, which are related to the gender gap. So we need to incentivate more women and young people to engage to the forest sector and how we can do this. We can do this, keep an improving working condition through the technological development. We can also alleviate it, the pay gap between men and women. And for sure, we can stimulate the creation of new ways to obtain benefits from forestry, it's not just financial 
but in a way that society get the best from forests. But the most important here is to invest in forest education and training. We need to create programs to reskill and requalify our current forest sector workforce to provide them the skills of the future and also ensure opportunities for this forest, forest sector workforce of the future. That was my short presentation. Thank you very much. And I will be glad to answer your questions. Very much, Emeline. Thank you for giving us insight into the situation in the green forest jobs in Europe or in the pan-European region. And um, yeah, the, the report, the June Institute will be published this summer. So I'm inviting you all to stay tuned on the June Institute website. Um, we. I did not mention in the beginning that we are recording this meeting and we will also publish it later. So just that you are all aware of the situation. We are coming now to our next part of the session. Here we will have um, four panelists coming into dialogue with each other. And we will frame the dialogues by little videos which were prepared by the EFI IFSA UFRO project. I would like to first introduce our um, speakers. We have uh, Sandra Rodriguez. She is a professor at the University in Chihuahua in Mexico. And uh, she's also the coordinator of the UFRO IFSA task force on forest education. She holds a PhD in environmental sciences in the forest management from Oklahoma State University. And her dissertation um, was awarded with the UFRO Outstanding Doctoral Research Award in 2014. She has over 15 years of international experiences in forest management and social aspects in forestry. She will be responsible for the educational perspective this, today. Then we have Valtteri Katayameki. He works at the International Labor Office in Geneva since 2013. He's currently a technical officer in rural economy with a specific emphasis on forestry sector. Valtteri has over a decade of international experiences, mostly focusing on rural economics. He has experiences from the Finnish foreign ministry and several organizations in Europe and Latin America. And he holds a degree from the University of Helsinki as well as the University of Liverpool. Welcome Valtteri, who will um, be representing the employment this today. For the students' uh, side, we have Isabel Claire de la Paz. She's a junior student of Bachelor of Science in Forestry at the University in the Philippines, specializing in urban forestry. Currently, she serves as the International Counselor of the International Forestry Students Association, IFSA. She is the Vice President of the Association in, of Filipino Forestry Students and a Communications and Outreach Program Team Volunteer in the Youth and Landscape Initiative. Isabel has a scholar of the Department of Science and Technologies in the Philippines and is a recipient of the Forest Student Professional Development Award. Welcome Isabel, presenting the students today. Last but not least, we've got Maureen Whelan. Maureen is a manager of international affairs for the Canadian Forest Service of Natural Resources Canada. She has worked over 25 years in a variety of roles including communication, strategic project programs delivery, and multilateral engagement. Maureen will in, uh, introduce the policy perspective today. A very a huge variety of our panel today. And we will start with a short video, which was, as I said, produced by the ethi ipsa UFRO project, Green Jobs, the future of employment in the forest sector. Santiago, please share the first video. The research conducted by EFI IFSA UFRO project showed that the student's decision to pursue a forest-related program was driven by the desire to do beneficial work and by the satisfaction that this work would bring them. Practical and field exercises also help students shape their career decisions. For instance, forest-related internships and traineeships can motivate them to choose a career in the forest sector. 
but students are still concerned about their limited knowledge on forest-related career options and how their studies will prepare them for the future. Green jobs initiatives are also unfamiliar to them, and universities don't promote them enough. However, the demand for university graduates with forest-related degrees has been on the rise, and internships and traineeships help the employers prepare the graduates for permanent positions. Therefore, the employers recommend universities to help students improve their generic skills and to encourage them to pursue internships and traineeships to equip them with the skills and experience required for the job market. Universities should also request for feedback from the employers on the performance of graduates, and they should form partnerships to better understand each stakeholder's needs and meet their expectations. Thank you very much for this first video. And um, yeah, we will start with our talk, which will be between Valtteri from the employment side and Sandra from the education side. Um, the first question would go to Valtteri. What do you see as some of the main changes in the world of work and how are these changes impacting the forest sector? Uh, thanks a lot, Vera, and good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. Indeed, the world of work is changing. It's going through transformative changes. And of course, forest sector is not an exception here, as this was very well highlighted by Emeline in her, in her great presentation at the beginning. Work in the sector is experiencing changes driven by megatrends such as globalization, demographic shifts, technological developments, and climate change. And these impact on various aspects of work systems and environments. What we see in the forest sector is that in many parts of the world, decent work deficits continue to remain uh, prevalent. With decent work deficits, we talk about issues related to the rights at work, working conditions, or access to social protection, for instance. Often these uh, deficits also, they have been uh, further exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. As we are all well aware, and as was also very well reflected by, by Emeline, safety and health risks are very common in, in forest work. And some of these like uh, heat stress or uh, risks related to the increased frequency and intensity of some extreme weather events, for instance, they are directly linked to climate change. Uh, from the perspective of training and education, this can lead to additional skills need in uh, uh, relation to, for instance, salvage logging or uh, different ways to avoid heat stress, for example, or mitigate heat stress as well. In terms of demographic shifts, we are changing. We are, we, are, we, are, we are seeing changing patterns in forestry workforce, depending on the country or region. Uh, in some countries and regions, uh, such as in Europe, uh, workforce is getting older and it is challenging to, to attract more young workers to work in the sector. While in other, other, other regions, we are seeing an influx of, of young workers or higher numbers of migrant workers uh, engaged in forestry. At the same time, uh, uh, we are seeing more diverse workforce. Even if some forestry activities continue to be uh, associated with the young, relatively young and uh, uh, strong men engaged in physical labor in challenging uh, natural environments, we are also seeing more and more involvement of women and men with different backgrounds, different qualifications, different capacities that, 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 that work, work in, in forestry. And again, from the perspective of training and education, uh, approaches that are more gender responsive or that take into account uh, particular situations of migrant workers, for example, are needed. On uh, technological advancements, uh, mechanization is, of course, having a major impact. Uh, and leveraging these technological developments, including in relation to digitalization, these can support higher productivity. They can improve the quality of the output and they can also improve, uh, contribute towards the improvement of working conditions. At the same time, of course, we shall keep in mind that in many parts of the world, world much of the forest work con continues to be conducted uh, manually or with inadequate working equipment. In many cases, uh, these uh, technological tools and solutions, they may not be available for those with limited resources, such as uh, small and medium enterprises or own account workers. And uh, they also may not be adequate training on how to use them. And of course, these challenges uh, are even bigger in the, those working in the informal economy. 
Of course, these and other changes are also bringing about new job op opportunities in the sector. Uh, while uh, it is likely that um, some more traditional forestry jobs will disappear or transfer, transform, there will also be many new opportunities in uh, forest related products and supply chains, including in areas such as circular economy, bioeconomy, reforestation and afforest, afore, afforestation, wood based construction and forest based leisure and eco tourism, uh, among others. If these are aligned with the just transition framework, which takes into consideration both environmental objectives on the one hand and decent work objectives on the other, then they constitute a real possibility to contribute towards sustainable development and low carbon and uh, resource efficient economy. Uh, I think I will leave it here for now. And moving on, Sandra, I would like to ask you, how do you see that these and uh, some other changes that you are experiencing are taking into consideration in forestry education? And how are the institutions uh, involved uh, prepared to respond to these changes? Thank you. Should I move it? Thank you. All right. And distinguished audiences, thank you very much for your um, for, for you being present here in this um, important side event. And thank you, Vera, for inviting me to participate in the name of the professors. Um, in general, Walter, to answer your question, I think that the universities are making changes, probably not as fast as we would like to, but we're making some progress, um, especially in the curriculum uh, to tackle those uh, issues that you just mentioned and that are associated to the forestry sector. In terms of, cl of climate change, for example, uh, universities are offering graduate programs that address all issues associated to climate change and forest related sciences. This implies, of course, that universities are investing on uh, laboratories and infrastructure to bring the to make the programs a little bit more interdisciplinary. Uh, and of course, this is um, there are differences among the countries and among the regions, of course. And also, uh, one important thing is that these changes are being done at the uh, graduate level. At the undergraduate level, we, are need, we are still need, need, need to work a little bit more and invest more um, to tackle this um, issue of, of climate change. In terms of demographics, and I'm going to speak uh, based on the data that we collect from the Global Survey on Forest Education that was conducted by IUFRO, FAO, and ITTO, 2020-2021. Um, the survey interviewed professionals, professors, and students. And the general perception is that gender is not considered a limitation to find a job um, or the kind of job for what professionals are hired for. However, around 30% of the students perceive gender as a factor that might affect employability. This result, according to my um, assessment, is telling us that students don't have a clear picture of the current job market. And that perhaps is caused because the lack of opportunities for students to engage in part-time jobs and internships in the industry sector and, and other sectors. Um, enrollment for women in forest program is on the rise, as you actually mentioned. And of course, we have to be careful on data because as um, Emily mentioned, in some parts of the world, enrollment is decreasing, but in some other parts of the world, it's on the rise. Um, and from my, from my personal experience working in two countries, I have seen the active participation of women in the forex sector and also working with IFSA students. I have, I have had the privilege to have worked with um, a student, women students who are very eager to attend mm -hmm. all the demands of the, from the students. Um, in, base of, uh, in terms of the te technology, again, referring to the global survey, Digital readiness varies among regions. Uh, for example, Europe 
and North America report the good use of technology tools for education. This perception is also followed by Latin America and the Caribbean region. However, Asia and Africa reported a limited use of technology in forest education. Uh, and again, uh, there, there are differences among countries and among the, within the regions. The use of geographical information systems, tools for communications and tools for publications of documents are the, the ones that are most, the most used. And ironically, the tools for field and mill operations were the less used. As you mentioned, Walter, in so many countries, we still uh, rely on main power to actually do some timber harvesting operations. That's unfortunately. Um, the respondents of the survey also indicate that new technological solutions are needed, in particular those related to the media. Of course, the pandemic showed us that the, the use of technology will help us professors, for example, in my case, to continue activities on education. However, we heavily rely on big companies to use to, for those technological tools, such as Google, Zoom, WebEx, and all those platforms that allow us to have our uh, online massive classes. Um, There's one minute two, left, please. In 2021, um, Google canceled the free service. So, and it was a challenge for some universities because they couldn't provide us with the technological tools anymore. So that means that universities need, need to invest more in technology to be self-sustained. And thank you. <laughs> thank you, Vera. So, uh, and also reflecting on this conversation, I, will, I would like to ask Walter that one of our challenges or the challenge of the forex sector is to ensure that it continues to attack to attract workforce in the future as well. How do you see that the sector could attract more young people to work in the forest? Thanks, Sandra. And I will respond to those very quickly considering the time, uh, time as well. Uh, and I think you actually mentioned quite a few very important points in this regard already in your, in your presentation here. Uh, I, first of all, I see this as more generally a challenge for uh, rural sectors, more in general, in, in many, in many countries and regions. Uh, not specific to forestry always. Of course, there are some uh, aspects that are very specific, but not, not always. So the, the sector needs to be able to demonstrate that, this offer, that it offers productive and meaningful jobs and career paths as well attractive opportunities in terms of uh, wages and benefits, of course, in terms of working conditions, in terms of safety, uh, among others. So it needs to be able to demonstrate that, that it is. And uh, as you highlighted very well, uh, Sandra, it needs to be able to take into consideration the specific needs of uh, groups such as women and migrant workers and, and, and other groups as well. So access to quality education, apprenticeships, uh, skills uh, certification, all, all these are very important points. Uh, I also agree with you, Sandra, that this is very much, uh, of course, linked to the, to the national context as well. As I mentioned earlier, in some countries, it's quite difficult to attract young people, but then in others, we may see a, a little bit of a challenge of having more and more young people in rural areas willing to take almost any job that is available because there are very limited opportunities. And this means that sometimes young people may be willing or forced, if you may, to work in uh, unfavorable in employment con uh, terms and even in inadequate working conditions. And often, of course, in the informal economy as well. So I just think that it's important to differentiate between the different uh, policy responses for different contexts in this regard as well. But I think uh, we will move to the next discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Vera. Back to you. Thank you, Walter. Thank you very much, Valtteri and Sandra. This was a great start, and we see that there's a lot of need for dialogue here. Thank you very much um, for sharing the, the changes and influences you see from both sides in the forest sector. Let's go directly to our second video. And um, Santiago, please show the second video.
The demand for university graduates with forest-related degrees has been on the rise. For example, graduates with bachelor's degrees are hired by employers who are willing to train them on the job. Furthermore, the scope of many organizations has been expanding in the last decade, hence the changes in skills that employers look for in graduates. On the one hand, forest economics, forest management and planning, and environmental protection are at the top three subject-specific skills considered essential by forest-related employers. On the other hand, the top three generic skills required by the employers are communication, problem solving, and creativity, according to the research conducted by the joint EFI, IFSA, IUFRA project. To help students improve the skills needed for their future jobs, IFSA launched the Tree e-learning platform, which consists of courses on soft skills and forestry. Students can also find information about different careers in forestry, links to other useful online courses, and material from past IFSA delegations. Internships and traineeships can also help students shape their careers in green jobs. Moreover, they will allow graduates to show the employers what they have learned at university, making it easier for the employers to evaluate their ability to fit in the organization. Thank you very much. And this brings us directly to our second talk between the education and the student side. So please, Sandra and Isabel, the floor is yours. You're both in Korea right now. So I'm looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you. So good, uh, good day, everyone who is here in Seoul, South Korea with us. And also good, uh, good morning to everyone there online. I am Isabel de La Paz. I am from the University of the Philippines, Los Banas from the Philippines, and I specialize in urban forestry. And as mentioned earlier in Emeline's presentation, uh, urban forestry is part of uh, contemporary forestry. And similar to traditional forestry, we also require to go outside and uh, survey trees and risk uh, and assess the risks that urban trees may have to the citizens that are nearby them. And in the past two years, uh, we have been uh, attending online classes because of strict COVID-19 restrictions in the Philippines. And I know that this is also the same for many countries all over the world. And personally, my experience in online classes is that I feel like my knowledge is confined to only theories. I can learn these theories through books, through modules, and through lectures, but I uh, generally lack um, on-ground experiences and how to apply these concepts. And as mentioned earlier by Sandra, um, most students in the Philippines and other countries do not have access to uh, technologies and the internet, which is why they have limited knowledge on, uh, on forestry-related uh, knowledge and skills. So this is why they tend to leave university and work in full-time jobs instead. And I know and I acknowledge that COVID-19 protocols are different in each country, as mentioned earlier. And practical experience and on-ground experiences are very important because it enables students to immerse in real-life applications of forestry. And which is why, uh, due to the pandemic, uh, I feel like most students, including me, lack practical experience and we lack competence in our professional careers in the future. Which is why I would like to ask Ms. Sandra, how are universities preparing to compensate for students' lack of practical experience in the field? Thank you, Samela. Uh, of course, for us, it's a um, pity not to be able to go to the field because of the pandemic. Um, but I think we, as a universities, might, might need to organize remedial programs, summer trainings, and accelerated educational programs that will compensate students from the lack of practical experience. Uh, of course, this requires inv investment and an, a big effort from the university administrators, professors, and of course, from the, from the students. Some universities, according to my experience, uh, have field practices at the end of the, the program. Let's say that at the end of the third year or fourth year, they have 
kind of like integrated practices. So they can train on soil, soil forest, dendrology, ecology in just one, once at a time. They don't have to go class by class to the field. And I think that that will be a good modification of the programs that don't have this kind of a practical field. So students who were impacted during 2020 to 2021 will be able to practice what they learned online. However, unfortunately, we will have a great number of students who graduated during, during that period of time and they might not have the time uh, to catch up. So therefore, I think that universities uh, will offer and coordinate with employers to provide some training for those students who were affected during COVID-19. That's my short answer, because I am not very sure what we are doing. We are still recovering from COVID-19. And of course, I know we as professors and university members are working really hard to, to tackle this issue of field practices. I am. I also have a question for you, <laughs> and a professor. I should answer questions, right? Um, besides practical fields that you mentioned because of COVID pandemic, what are those competences that you think and that you mentioned that you need more competences? Students needed to be successful in the job market. Yes. So thank you for the question, uh, Ms. Sandra. So as mentioned in the uh, EFI, IFSA, and IUFRO, uh, there are two types of skills that all students, not only forestry students, need in order to succeed in the job market in all of the sectors. Of course, we need soft skills and uh, the field-specific skills. And in our case, uh, this is forestry skills. So the first one is the soft skills. We would need communication, problem solving, leadership, and creativity skills, as you may have watched earlier in the video. And for forestry skills, I learned that in the EFI IFSA IUFRO Green Jobs Project that there are top three subject-specific skills that employers find in applicants. And that includes uh, forest economics, forest management and planning, and environmental protection. Which is why, aside from fieldwork, I believe that universities must also encourage students to pursue traineeships and internships because, uh, you know, knowledge can easy, easily be gained in the classroom. It can easily be read in the books, in the modules, and in the lectures. But I believe that experiences are the best teacher and it is the best way for us students to gain skills. Which is why IFSA also... Uh, launched the tree learning platform where uh, forestry students and even those who are just uh, uh, interested in forestry can learn about these two types of skills, the soft skills and forestry skills. And we believe uh, that we need these skills in order to be competent in the professional field in the futures. And of course, this issue is not the sole responsibility of the educators. I believe that this is also an issue that must be handled by the students, which is why we must go hand in hand together as universities and the students. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sabela. There is something that we were discussing when we, work, when we were working on the uh, global study, is the term of soft competences. We might call them basic competences because they're no longer soft, they are, very important for professionals to succeed in their in workplace. So we also found in the global report of, on forest education, the need for students to develop this type of competences. And those basic competences are part of the long line learning process of any person, therefore, um, the, I think we need more extracurricular, extracurriculum activities that would help students to develop such competences. Those extracurriculum, of course, internships are very important, on-campus jobs, research and teaching assistance should be available for students, and in addition, workshops and webinars with experts from those fields, 
uh, to facilitate students, students the, the knowledge and the learning and practices of the competences. Uh, I also think that fostering students' organizations in the universities is a good way for students to develop such competences, such leadership that it was mentioned, administration, communication, problem solving, and time management that we lack of that, even me personally. Uh, I, I think those extracurricular activities are very important in the forest programs. Um, finally, I would like to say that I've been working with the students since 2015 with IFSA students, and I have seen how the differences between IFSA members and non-IFSA members, how they develop those competences better than students who are not engaged in uh, students' organizations. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. It's fantastic to see how the students and the teachers come into dialogue and uh, that you can share your views. And yeah, thank you very much also for emphasizing your, your personal perception, how important it is to gather all these uh, experiences in the field. I must say, I'm, I'm feeling very sorry for students in the Corona time. It must, I mean, remembering my studies, the, the field trips actually were the best part of my studying. And I really hope, uh, Isabel, that you and your um, colleagues will have the chance to, to gain at least a little bit of these fantastic experiences. Our third video um, will be also be our last video today. So we've got three videos, but four talks. And um, yes, please, Santiago, share the third video. Our societies increasingly value environmental services and the demand for sustainable wood-based products is growing as scientific and technological advancements continue. This has led to a rise in forest-related employment, especially ecotourism. There is a general trend towards upskilling and a growing number of workers with tertiary education in the whole forestry workforce. Moreover, the demand for university graduates with forest-related degrees has been on the rise in the last decade. Student enrollment numbers are fluctuating, with an increase in some countries like Brazil, China and Indonesia, and a decline in others like Finland. There is also a shift from classical forestry programs to environment and conservation related ones in countries like the USA. In a nutshell, green jobs transform occupational profiles and workforce composition. Besides, they can also contribute to the creation of new forest-related employment opportunities. Yet students not only have little knowledge about green job initiatives, but also do not feel sufficiently prepared by universities to take up these jobs. Therefore, to secure a skilled workforce in the forest-related employment, including green jobs, policymakers need to create spaces for discussion on how to raise awareness among students about forest-related careers and study options. This was a perspective between students and policymakers, and it's my pleasure to have both stakeholders here in our session today. So I would like to give the floor to Isabel and Maureen talking with each other. And um, yeah, please, Isabel, the floor is yours. So hello again, everyone who are uh, who is in here personally in South Korea, and to those who are in our Zoom. Um, so. Like I mentioned earlier, um, some Filipinos do not have access to uh, internships and traineeships, both on national and international level. But at the same time, many Filipinos in my country, and also this might be the same for students from other countries, they are financially capable of, uh, of taking their internships abroad and uh, in their own countries. And I'm also very fortunate to be here in the World Forestry Congress speaking in this session and at the same time play an integral role in IFSA as their internal counselor. During my, my term as internal counselor, I've gained 
many generic and even forestry specific knowledge and skills that I know I will uh, I will use when I become a professional in the forestry sector. And at the same time, I've been able to network with uh, different uh, organizations, both locally and internationally, and, and yes, at attend conferences as well. And I would like to acknowledge that many Filipinos and many people around the world are in the lower income class. And in the case of the Philippines, 99% uh, of the Filipinos are poor or they are in the lower income class. And most people I know want to have the same opportunity as I have. And they also want to thrive in the field of forestry as students, but they are financially incapable of doing so. Which is why my question to Ms. Marine is, how can policymakers support opportunities for students in developing their generic and forestry-related skills in the local and international arenas? Thanks very much, Isabel, and, and good morning, uh, afternoon, and evening to participants in this session. Um, I'm going to speak from my personal perspective. Um, I work for the uh, federal government of Canada with Natural Resources Canada. So I can speak to some of my experiences in dealing with some of the challenges uh, that you've laid out. Um, my organization has a really interesting approach uh, called the Policy Analyst Recruitment Program because, you know, making policy, uh, policy making is not always the most exciting uh, thing in the world, but it's very important. So we have this program where we bring in master's level students and we do that through recruitment programs with universities. Uh, and every year we have intake of, of uh, what we call PARDs or, and these you apply, you go to the program and you identify which sector you're interested in working in. And in our department, we have mining, we have energy, we have forestry, we have remote sensing. So there's a lot of different options. So when somebody is hired, and they're generally new graduates, they're hired as a permanent employee. So that, first of all, is, is really impressive. And then they're hired at what we call an e, EC3 level, which is a, a nice level. It's an entry level. Then they'd spend a year in one sector. They graduate up. And then they move to another sector and graduate up. So at the end of their, you know, the third year, they have a really broad sense of the landscape in terms of, you know, what are the policy requirements to work in different uh, natural resource sectors. So it's a really good learning experience and um, they become very specialized in policy, but they have a lot of different inputs and they, they have a different perspective, which is really important. Um, and we talk about soft competencies and, and how uh, we can bridge the divide. I'm just going to give you some advice from my personal experience that one of the best skills, the essential skills uh, you have when you graduate um, is to be a good communicator. You can have all the best knowledge in the world, but if you cannot communicate it efficiently, uh, succinctly, and be able to take information from a variety of different uh, opinions and perspectives, um, it's not going to, you know, you'll, you'll probably struggle. And I think that's really one of the things that all schools need to uh, emphasize more is to teach people to write and to be really effective communicators because that's what's going to take you through. And um, I'm just going to just say one more thing. And I know you, it's been brought up that not all countries have equal access to the internet and, and COVID has taught us, you know, it's provided a lot of challenges, but it has provided some opportunities. And I think I look at us here, uh, you know, this wouldn't have been possible. Uh, you know, we wouldn't have dreamt about it five or six years ago. But one of the things I do and it, it in, in my team, and I think there's a lot of groups who do it because now all of a sudden everybody can attend meetings virtually that we haven't been able to do before. And that's a really interesting way to start looking at what are the different options out there in terms of forestry. So I have my team, they're going to all kinds of international conferences on things they would have, that aren't really in, in our core day-to-day -day business, but it's allowing them to stay on top of trends 
but it's also allowing them to broaden their experience. And I don't think we're ever going to go back to a completely uh, in-person world. I think hybrid is probably the way of the future. So I think, you know, students can really broaden their horizons and attend some of these different um, sessions. Now, I have a question for you. Um, as a student, what do you see as the, uh, the biggest barriers to gaining employment in the forest sector? So thank you, Maureen. And uh, yes, as mentioned earlier, um, many students, including me, uh, we feel like we lack on-ground experiences. And this includes like we lack the competence to apply for forestry related jobs. This is especially true um, uh, since the start of the pandemic, because like I mentioned earlier, we uh, did not have enough access to face to face classes or in person classes. And aside from uh, the lack of competence for forestry related jobs, we also lack generic skills which we cannot learn merely from uh, online classes. And like I mentioned earlier, a lot of the people that I know from my university, they stopped um, taking classes and instead uh, took other full-time jobs. And I believe that this, would, this issue would further lead to underemployment in the Philippines and uh, in many countries in the world. And like you said, Ms. Maureen, that the pandemic that we're experiencing now is a crucial time, um, in, especially in education. And the forestry students are the most vulnerable because like Vera mentioned earlier, um, during her time, they were able to go to a lot of places and learn forestry knowledge uh, firsthand. But for us now, during the pandemic, we are not able to do so. So thank you. And I would like to ask my second question to Maureen. Uh, how can collaborations between the students and the policymakers be enhanced to raise awareness on the significance of forest-related careers and study options? Thanks for your answer and, and for the second question, Isabel. Um, I mean, at the risk of repeating myself, I'm just gonna say, I think we all have to be a little bit uh, move outside our comfort zone and look for different opportunities um, and be bold. You know, I think there's a lot of, you know, you see job uh, advertisements out there and some of the organizations have such complex hiring processes, uh, especially government and intergovernmental organizations. And I received numerous CVs that are just, you know, they just arrived, there's no, there's no connection with the person. But, you know, when people call me, uh, and I'm not encouraging everybody to call everybody, but every now and then, if you get a text or a call or something that make a connection and somebody really says, I really want to work in your organization, I really want to work in your field, um, that generates a relationship. And what we've been trying to do, at least in, in our very small international affairs team, we work with, you know, not with, we work with, but we do have a good collaboration with IFSA. And for example, when we prepared for, I think one of the last in-person World Force or United Nations Forum of Forest meetings, you know, we did a webinar with them beforehand, but then also we arranged on site to have every day to have different students sit with us at the flag to help you know, explain well why we were doing certain interventions, what we were looking for, just to give that policy experience because it can look very odd if you're not engaged in the day-to-day -day operations of international forest policy. And then we do a debrief after them. And another example I can point to is when we hosted the United Nations uh, ECE uh, Conference on Committee on Forest and Forest Industry in Canada a number of years ago. When we agreed to host it, we agreed on the condition that students be involved in the panel discussions, not only as volunteers, you know, helping with registration and things like that. Those are really good networking opportunities, but it's really critical to be involved in the program delivery. And those options exist. I mean, it's, it's you know, I would also say, that, you know, the students have to go look for those. It's not always the policymakers 
or the employer's job to, to lead you to them. Um, so I think, you know, it's a bit of a two-way street and I would encourage uh, involvement in, you know, any type of organization um, and especially now in a, in a kind of a hybrid world, I think, you know, organizations are more open to taking on uh, volunteers. And as you said, internships are critical. And I would also say mentoring is really important, especially if you're not getting into the field. And being able to connect with somebody who is a little bit further advanced in their career, who has the field experience, nothing is going to replace that. But there's also some ways to just kind of connect with people who have that experience and, and try to at least establish a relationship. And when life goes back to somewhat normal, to have maybe a little bit of a, a you know, an advantage in terms of gaining from their experience. One minute left, please. Um, so as a student, Isabel, what would you like to see from policymakers to enhance your ability to work in the policy realm? So thank you. Due to the time restriction, I will just speed my uh, suggestions up. So first is uh, the involvement of the youth and young professionals in steering committees and advisory committees. And uh, through IFSA, we have already been doing this through uh, external department subcommissions, we are able to serve as a liaison to other uh, international and regional forestry organizations. And at the same time, mentorship, like Maureen uh, mentioned earlier. And um, for internships and mentorship programs or traineeships, uh, I believe that um, the policymakers can also help us by providing us sufficient financial and capacity support, especially for those who are in, in developing countries like in the Philippines. And uh, we've been talking earlier about the hybrid meetings, which I think is the future of opportunities from now on. Uh, through hybrid meetings, we are able to network online and broaden our experiences, our knowledge, and our skills virtually. And at the same time, we don't know when the COVID-19 pandemic will end. So hybrid meetings can definitely reduce the risk of us being infected by the virus. And this opens the opportunities to many students who are unable to fly abroad to attend conferences or meetings. So uh, yes, I suggest that the policymakers should support forestry students in the regional and international level to, uh, to have these opportunities. So thank you. Thank you, Maureen and Isabel, for those very interesting points you make here. And I also see that this intergeneral dialogue is, is crucial. And um, also the new reality we are facing with the hybrid meetings is probably the new normal. So thank you very much for these, sharing these views. Um, let's go directly to our last talk today between uh, Valtteri and Maureen. So between the policy and the employment side. And uh, my first question would go to Maureen. Um, working in the federal government forestry organization for a long period of time, what are the major changes you have seen over your career in terms of, of the type of work that has been done? Um, but also the type of skills that are necessary to do these works. Well, it's a good thing you gave me a time limit because I could just talk for ages on this. So uh, I'm still young at heart. We'll just say that. But I, you know, I'm close on to, close to 30 years uh, in in forestry, uh, and it's changed so much. Um, when I first started. Um, I, I think some of the more obvious ones is gender balance. Uh, you know, I was often the only woman in a room. And first, let me tell me, my background is that I am not a forester. I will confess that to all of you here. My background is actually political science and communications. So often in a boardroom, I would be the only woman. And I was either expected to make coffee or take notes. Uh, so I'm happy to say that has changed. Um, there's still a way to go as, as earlier speakers uh, mentioned. And I would just, for those who are interested, point to a program that Canada has started through the Canadian Institute of Forestry 
call Free to Grow. And that's about including uh, recruiting women, Indigenous and New Canadians, Indigenous peoples and New Canadians into the forest sector. So I'll share the link a little bit later, but I, I'd encourage you to look at that. It's a very interesting program. I think one of the other big things that's changed is society's expectations and recognitions around recognition of, of forests. And the demands, you know, what society has really put a focus on the environmental uh, aspects. And that's changed the nature of the work, I think, in the forest sector. So I work in a research organization. And I can say that at the beginning of my career, a lot of the research was around productivity. It was around ecological function. It was around, you know, growth and yield and, and those types of things. And those were the types of folks we had. You know, we had researchers, we had technicians. Now we're covering, as, as many of the speakers alluded to, it's, it's a, a new world. So we, now we have economists, we have social, um, social scientists, we have climate change, we have modelers, we have, you know, IT requirements are very, very much different. Um, there's a need for a broader skill set. And I would argue on the policy side, we're seeing more generalists um, and who are able to have, you know, be able to synthesize information from a, a number of different fronts. Uh, and so that's really important because science policy integration is critical uh, in advancing a lot of the uh, achievements of, or the objectives of sustainable forest management. Having said that, we see the decline uh, in forestry graduates, and that's concerning because we need that, at the beginning of the value chain, the sustainability is the, is the critical piece. So um, I just wanna point out that having a knowledge of forest science and operational realities is central to the success of, you know, programming, forest-based programming in terms of some of the programs we run. And I'll stop it there. Um, I'd like to ask a question to Valtteri. Uh, of course, governments do not work on these issues alone. Uh, and it's also very important to take into consideration the role of other key actors of the world of work, in addition to the government, specifically employers and workers. How do you see the role of these actors in the promotion of more and better jobs in forestry? Thank you very much, Maureen, uh, for, the, for the great insights as well, based on your, your great experience, many good points made there. Uh, from the ILO's perspective, the question that you posed is actually at the very heart of, of our work. And I have two key points that I would like to emphasize in relation to this. The first one is the, importance of having in place coherent and effective laws based on international labor standards, which are duly implemented and complied with, as this is actually a precondition for advancing safe, decent and sustainable work and just transition in forestry. It might sound a little bit uh, boring even, but in fact, this is a, a very important point for this discussion, as these national legal and policy frameworks and their implementation, these are essentially defining the conditions in which the current and future forest, uh, forestry workers and employers operate in, uh, as they set provisions on issues like rights at work, working conditions, safety and health, social protection, and also related to, to, the, to the education and training and skills development. And when I say that this should be based on international labor standards, this is because these uh, international labor standards, they, they lay down the basic minimum standards uh, for decent work. These are agreed upon at the global level in a tripartite manner by governments, employers, and workers. As an example that I, I think that is quite uh, relevant for this, uh, this event as well, uh, next month, the ILO's uh, annual labor conference uh, is going to be discussing, is going to have a standard setting discussion on apprenticeships. Uh, and there a possible new standard on this topic is, is being discussed. And as has been highlighted by Isabel from the student's perspective, but also by others in this, in this meeting, this is actually a topic that is highly relevant and important for this uh, sector as well. So, so here we can see the direct, uh, direct linkage of, of these to, 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 the, to the issue. In many cases, at the same time, we see that uh, even where uh, appropriate legislation is in place, 
it might not be adequately complied with. And uh, in forestry, for instance, this is uh, partially due uh, because uh, in some countries, uh, in general, rural workers, including forest workers, may not be covered uh, by labor legislation. And this means that many, many workers are actually left out from the opportunity to be able to enjoy their, uh, their rights at work. Also, the high levels of informality that we see in many countries among forest workers, uh, especially many lower in income countries, is, is relevant to this. And also, as we know, forest work often takes place in isolated uh, and remote rural areas. And this means that labor administration and labor inspection systems may not have the, the capacity or uh, financial and human resources to actually reach out to these forestry operations. So making this uh, monitoring and compliance with the legislation challenging. So there is a lot of work to be done there, but I, I do think that this is, a, this is a highly relevant point. And then the second topic, um, uh, this is uh, to say that it is very important to promote inclusive social dialogue at different level as a key approach for improving uh, the performance of the sector and for achieving decent and sustainable work in, in the sector as well. Uh, we see that in some uh, areas of the overall forest sector, thinking for instance uh, the paper industry in the northern, northern European region, uh, they have relatively strong and well-established uh, organizations and social dialogue institutions and mechanisms in place. Uh, but many times, uh, and in many, many other contexts, forest workers and employers, they are rarely organized and uh, social dialogue mechanisms, if they exist at all, they may be very weak. Uh, the high number of informal workers, self-employed workers, and micro and small enterprises in forestry, and also the seasonal nature and the, the, what I mentioned, the isolation, the geographic isolation, these also make uh, organization of workers and employers and establishment of social dialogue uh, more challenging in, in forestry. And we also see that where we do have these organizations, uh, they may be often quite fragmented and have very low levels of, of membership and, and organization levels. So organizing through employers and workers organizations or through other types of organizations like uh, cooperatives or producers uh, associations, for instance, they can provide representation and voice, including uh, that has been mentioned various times for women, uh, youth and indigenous, indigenous peoples. Uh, participation in these organizations can increase the bargaining power. It can upgrade uh, productive capacities and technical and entrepreneurial skills. And of course, it can improve access to finance and uh, appropriate productive resources among, among other benefits. So by bringing together different social actors in the world of work, different actors in the forest sector, uh, social dialogue can contribute towards improving productivity and conditions of work, as well as forest governance, management, conservation and sustainability, sustainable use of resources. Uh, with this, where I hand the floor back to you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Valtteri, and thank you, Maureen, for these um, very different perspectives and very important statements you made here. So we have a lot of different needs and expectations on the sector, but we also have all these different, yeah, let's say realities of, of what is actually possible as well. So um, yeah, thank you very much for this uh, dialogue today. I would now like to open the floor for questions. We have about 10 to 12 minutes, so we should be able to cover a, a couple. Um, and I'm very happy to have uh, Simone Masaro on my side. Um, he's our um, person in Korea. He's a master's student of forest um, and ecosystem services at the University of Göttingen. And he's also the executive secretary um, for the International Forestry Students Association. And Simone will take care of the questions in the room in Korea. And um, Simone, the floor is yours. And I'm curious to see what our audience would like to hear more on. Yes. Um, so we are ready for questions. So there is a mic there. You can see. So if you raise your hand, please go to the mic and ask your question. Thank you. Um, hi, um, my name is David Gritt and I work with RECOF and I manage a program at RECOF, the Explore program, which is supporting researchers in Southeast Asia to do research. 
on forest landscape governance. I've, I've got one question and three points. I mean, one encouragement, and I'm inspired by our colleague Marie from Forrester Marie from the Philippines, is activism, that students need to be activists. And it's not just related to the topics that you're researching or working in, but also activism to create uh, a better environment to study and also to work in. And I, I'm inspired by that. So thank you very much for that. Um, the other thing is just to encourage you also, uh, there was a couple of mentions of internships and traineeships. So for RECOF, for example, we particularly focus and encourage interns from Asia Pacific region, paid internships. I mean, I do want to emphasize that paid internships <laughs> and it's a program of 12 months as well. So please, if you're from Asia Pacific, just contact us and we'll see what we can do. Um, my question is, is linked to gender. And what I would actually like is, is if so, and I offer actually, do you have guidelines on how universities, research institutions, but universities primarily can support female students, address issues about harassment, for example, for students, supporting them doing field work? Because I think your findings emphasize the importance of that. And I think it will be important if you have guidelines for that. Thank you. I believe this question could be addressed to me. <laughs> Thank you, David. Uh, we, so far, we don't have these guidelines. However, we have in IUFRO, we have a tax force on gender in forestry sector. So they're working on some projects and in the future, we might have a, a concrete answer to your question but you you guys are very welcome to review our website and all the work that we do in IUFRO of course this goes back to this morning session communication how we communicate our results um, you're very welcome to 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 review our our website IUFRO website and you will find the tax force there and if you need more information, I will be glad to provide that for you in short. Thank you. And, and if I can add here also TIPSA, we have a gender subcommission and we are actively working on an open letter on gender where to highlight a problem and to also provide concrete suggestions. So that's really something that we are trying to do at TIPSA. We really didn't find gender as one of our priorities and so hopefully in a few months, we are going to have this open letter and try to distribute around with universities and policymakers to give some concrete suggestions on what could be done to really include gender into the education and not only after. Um, yes, there is a question in the back, please. Yes, uh, ask with the microphone. Okay, thank you so much. My name is uh, Fola Babalala. I'm a lecturer, a researcher from University of Ilonin in Nigeria. And with what we are discussing, I have a concern, a very big concern for forestry. With what is going on around the world, concerning the way some university, most universities are changing their names. Right now, we tend to adopt more of natural resources, environmental program, and facing out forestry. And changing the name from forestry to environment, and natural resources. And my concern is very soon we will, we will stop hearing something like forestry in some programs because it, it creates some kind of dislike in the mind of students. You see, students don't really apply for forestry. Like me, I did not apply for forestry, but I was just moved to forestry because I did not get my first choice at the university during admission. So now, when we are even now changing the name, then what is the future for forestry in the university? That's a big concern for me. Now, another concern is most programs are now going online and we have complaining of practicals. Now you see programs of one year programs, master degree online, I can just offer a, a European forestry from Africa. And I'll be given a certificate of European forestry and never visit a forest in Europe. Mm -hmm. And I have a certificate of European forestry in my room from Africa. How can we blend all this mm -hmm. with respect to forestry programs all over the world? We have a very big concern and forestry is on that threat. Thank you.
Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for, for sharing this uh, concerns you have. Um, I mean, the, I didn't like hear a, a concrete question, but it's definitely important to, to state it also so clearly. And um, well, I'm not sure if we can do anything about it, but I'm also happy to ask the panelists if you would like to comment on this. Uh, I think that the changes in name, um, Dr. Fola, are because of the bad reputation that forestry has. And that was presented yesterday during the um, forest education session, that that was one of the biggest, our biggest problem, the bad reputation, because we are a um, timber harvest oriented. And that is no a longer like by the society in general. Uh, and that is also because we don't have good knowledge on sustainable forest management since the very little, since when we are little. That's why forest education is important. So therefore people will understand what is sustainable forest management, because we all know that many people around the world um, have their income from managing the forest. And that is a re reality. And a good sustainable forest management will provide many opportunities for many people in the world. But again, we need to teach our children and future, ge future generations on the understanding of sustainable forest management. Um, that answer, uh, is that kind of answer your question or your concern about the changes in, in, in the name? And yesterday we was discussing with some colleagues that uh, we need to have some requirements on what is taught in forestry programs. And we need to have some standards. And I think that uh, that conversation needs to go further. Thank you to Dr. Mika Ricola who bring that issue to us. Uh, of course, we need some standards and to be able to deliver certificates on forestry. So we cannot deliver a certificate if you don't know, if you, have, if you have not been in the forest. And those are big topics that we need to address in the future. Um, I think that's the answer for you. I would, I would also like to um, answer the question. So um, when I applied for university, forestry was also not my first choice. And like you, I was also just um, put into the forestry program as a second or third choice. But now that I am currently on my third year, I now realize the importance of being a forestry student, especially in um, today's generation, which is why I joined um, my local organization in my university and also IPSA uh, because I believe that it's my responsibility and other young people's responsibility to share why forestry should be the career of um, the future generation. And I hope that uh, every young person here also in this room um, would also take that responsibility. So thank you. Thank you, Isabel. For the maybe, maybe if I may also very quickly just... Uh, Yes. To, to, to react on this. Uh, so, so, of course, you know, we need to take into consideration and uh, accept that, that, that forest sector, uh, forest degradation and uh, deforestation, they contribute to climate change. And uh, also forests have, of course, great opportunities to contribute to mitigating the climate change. So that's why we can't only look at one side. We have to take into account both sides. And here, the just transition approach, which I mentioned, is, is very important. So we kind of... Uh, the, the, the industry needs to start taking steps, steps towards moving a more sustainable, uh, sustainable practices. And of course, in this, uh, one of the options is to move towards this more uh, general uh, natural resource management approach, not always um, necessarily uh, valid, but, but in some cases. And I think here that the important is that the sector actually is taking those steps towards sustainability, not just says that they are taking, but actually demonstrates by actions that they are taking. And we are seeing this in, in many parts of the, of, the, of the world. And for instance, uh, going back to what Emilin was saying at the very beginning on the concept of green jobs, for the ILO, the green jobs aspect, it's not only contributing to 
uh, environmental sustainability or environmental benefits, but also ensuring the social aspect, that the decent work considerations are taking taking into account. So I think you know it's it's a little bit uh, the way that we look at from the just transition perspective, the both sides uh, of the of the issue. But this is a very important point. I do agree with you on that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We have another question in the audience. Two questions. I would say um, you're first. Uh, right. Yes. Please ask your question. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Mika Rekola. Sandra just mentioned me. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. coming from the University of Helsinki and I'm a uh, coordinator of forest uh, education research group at UFRO, being heavily involved with this uh, FAO, FAO study. Um, thanks for this session and congratulations. Many, many nice, nice topics has been raised. Um, I'm asking uh, something which is really down earth there, something um, which your students, you, you could do, because it's not so much you can do with the name of the program, for example. It's, it's a good topic, but there's nothing to do with, with you. Even I have very little power for those, those kind of things, being as a director of the, of the master program still. But that is what we call agency. Do you know what it is? Well, uh, those generic competencies mentioned like a communication, uh, what was the networking and, and things like that, they are, they are good. They are something you definitely need. But if you stay at home, you don't be active, even though you are a great communicator, <laughs> you are missing your opportunities. So why I'm saying this, um, we have been so much stressing at many, many times extracurricular things, which is good, okay. But you can do a lot in the classroom. You can be active. And when teachers like myself are asking you to do something, take it as a positive thing. Uh, for, ex for example, uh, teachers are sometimes stacked. We are all sometimes stacked in, in the routines. We want to do them like we have used to do them. <laughs> Teachers are organizing like something like excursions. Hope, hope so someday <laughs> after the pandemic. And they are doing a lot of work to contact, contact companies here and there. And they are in a stress. Well, I have to do everything like this. It could be that students could organize them. They could do the networking for companies and organizations. So if ever any teachers is making a proposal that why we couldn't do this together, take this as a positive thing, not, that, not something that, okay, he's asking us to do his job or her job. No, it's not that way. It would be really beneficial for you. So you can even propose for a teacher if they don't find this as an opportunity. Why couldn't we do this excursion or something special together? So this is my comment. And also my question, if you, if you know this kind of a ways to, to do this agency, to, to take the active role, please let me know. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, does anyone from the panel wants to answer? Or add an additional comment? Otherwise, we had another question in the back. Um, yeah, I would say please ask your question. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ainur Mamadova. I'm I'm currently a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Padua, and uh, I would like to uh, bring back the discussion to the topic of care for students and focus on the topic of mental health. So as we know, as a young generation, we are more prone to, you know, to experience climate um, and uh, climate despair and climate anxiety. And this is specifically 
um, real for, for those uh, in conservation jobs, th those who go to the field and, you know, engage in field experiences. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if there are any programs or strategies that you think of, mm -hmm. or you are planning to, to address this issue specifically. Thank you very much. Um, yes, from IU Fro perspective, we are also trying to incorporate a new tax force on forest health. And of course, it's under discussion and uh, it will have a lot of projects as we have done in the past with the tax force on forest education. Um, but in terms of universities, I'm not aware. Uh, um, I might need to do some research to provide a concrete answer to you. But as far as I know, um, I don't. I don't have information about it. Um, in my university, the University of the Philippines, Las Banas, uh, every semester we have a one week break off. Uh, it's called the reading break or. A mental health break so for one week we are not uh we're discouraged from uh completing our tasks and taking synchronous classes and for the succeeding week we are not able uh, we are not allowed to submit any requirements so maybe that is something that other universities and other countries can also adapt to address mental health issues of their students Thank you. Thank you very much for the questions and, and comments. I'm afraid we have to come to an end, although I would love to, to continue this inspiring um, discussion and also include some questions from the chat. There was also some uh, action going on, but looking at the time, I would like to, to come to an end and uh, very briefly also give you some information what Forest Europe was doing regarding green jobs to promote different green jobs. You see, in the background of my screen, the hashtag Grow Green Jobs. This is actually a um, communication campaign on Instagram. So you can use your smartphone and um, check out the foresteurope.org where we have a campaign showing different videos of green jobs in the forest sector um, to inspire also what is possible. So it's classical jobs, traditional jobs, but also new kind of job for example, forest bathing or forest therapy. And if you have a green job yourself, uh, I welcome you to hashtag yourself using hashtag grow green jobs to make this more and growing. So we have like a, a communication campaign online with inspired uh, young people. And um, yeah, we have the information in the chat. And uh, coming to an end, I would like to, to thank very much all the participants again. We had a very intensive discussion. So we had first the setting the scene from the Tune Institute. Um, we had our dialogues of the four different stakeholder groups, which were the education, employment, policy, and students' perspective. And I hope it was inspiring for you and you also get some uh, new information. Um, I would like to share all the links as well um, in the chat, but also on screen, um, who participated today. So if you would like to have more information, um, just have to go to the next slide. Please don't hesitate to, to visit our websites and contact us. And yeah, let me thank once again all the panelists, but also all the audience, uh, virtual and in Korea. I wish you all a safe travel home today or tomorrow. And thank you very much for the World Forestry Congress for the possibility to host this side event today. And yes, um, I would like to, to thank everyone and take care and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.